So as we said, he met his wife. Now, when he got married, his wife was 16 and he was 21. Right? So there's five years difference. And she didn't know him and he didn't know her. And um, her, her family members were, um, they dealt in bell metal, silver and gold. <coughs> and when they got married, one gold ring was given. Right? It's a big thing then, gold ring. And good, I got, and there was cooking utensils and pots and saris and dodies and all that, you know, all that sort of stuff you get when you get married. All the anatas started to come. Not the good I've had anatas, but people give you all the stuff, right? And there was one gold ring, and he said, This ring means Hiranyakashipu. Soft beds and enjoyment. And he threw it into the forest. It's never seen again. He said, That ring was mine. And that's how he lived his life, you know. There was no accumulating any <laughs> all and artists and this and that. So he met his wife on the day of the marriage. He had no prior contact with her. And at the marriage ceremony, he saw her for the first time in his life. His parents and the parents of his wife arranged the marriage. It was a Vedic marriage. He said he didn't go looking for a wife. Well, he didn't want to get married, but on the order of his mother and his uncle, go to Nathagiri, he did it. He, um, <clears throat> Gurudev's mother, I will say this about her, that it is said, whoever came to their door, she would feed them or give them something. Right? No one left there empty handed. And his mother fasted every Saturday for the benefit of the whole family. Pious woman. She, every night she did Tosiyadi, read the Bhagavatam, and then read the Purana, from the Puranas. And she had a little brush bandhu, Guru Maharaj, the little boy, and she'd hold his hand and they'd walk around Tulsi and they'd do Tulsiyadi. Pretty cute, huh? <laughs> Can you imagine a film of that? <laughs> um, so as a green hustler, he would work all day and as a teacher and study the Shastra into the late hours of the night, sleeping only two or three hours. Have you ever tried to sleep in two or three hours? It's very difficult. <laughs> he was doing it every night. I remember there was one time in Bhubaneshwara, Guru Mahesh, because he'd only sleep a couple of hours in the night, then he'd have a sleep in the afternoon for about an hour. And that sort of, you know, he thought that was okay. And one day, and he came out for the day, so said I couldn't sleep because there was a line of ants <laughs> coming up the bed and on the mattress at it. He's just continually biting him. He thought, okay, I'm not sleeping today. <laughs> he thought that was funny. So then, as a Grihast, he had a checklist of 27 vows he would go through each day. Right? Uh, in this book, we've given about two, four, six, seven of them, but I'm going to read them. They're in the life story, okay? And this is a checklist of 27 vows that he would go through every day as a checklist to see, just to keep track of himself, okay? This is the list, you ready? Appendix one, the 27 vows of Brajabandhu. So Brajabandhu Manik, our Guru Dev, who became His Divine Grace, Srila Gorgovinda Swami Maharaj, Paramahamsa Mahabhagavat. This was the checklist in his daily Grihastha life, 27 vows, number one, how many hours did you sleep? In other words, don't sleep too much. At what time did you get out of bed? How many malas of Japa did you chant today? So how many rounds did you do? How long did you spend in Nam Smarana Kirtan today? How many pranayams he did meditation did you do today? And his wife, I interviewed her, and Janice Ray interviewed her. And she said on twice to Janish, once to me, on a number of occasions she went past her husband's room and the door was open and he was floating off the ground in lotus, like this chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> 
And she said another thing is, it was pretty amazing, was that whatever he wanted, which was never much, but whatever he wanted seemed to manifest in front of him. She said that was very amazing. Anyway, um, <clears throat> how long did you perform asan today? For how long did you perform one asan? Were you regular in your meditation today? How many Gita slokas did you read today or learn by heart? How long did you spend in the company of sadhus today? How long did you observe mourner silence for today? How long did you spend in disinterested, selfless service today? How much did you give in charity today? How many mantras did you write today? How long did you practice in physical exercise today? So not only spiritually, mentally, but physically as well, you have to look after yourself. How many lies did you tell today? And what did you do to atone for this? How many times did you get angry today? And for how long? And what was your atonement for that? <laughs> How many hours did you spend in useless company today? How many times did you fail in brahmachari life today? How long did you spend today in the study of religious books? How many times did you fall prey to evil habits and with what self-punishment? How long did you concentrate on your ishtadeva, nigun meditation, and sagun meditation, material? Nigun is spiritual, Sagu is material. So what was your meditation, spiritual or material, and how long for? What virtues are you developing? What evil qualities are you trying to eradicate? What sense is troubling you the most? How many days did you observe in fasting and vigilance? And the last one, at what time did you go to bed? So they were the 27 vows of Brajabandhu Manik, who became Srila Kogavinda Swami, Acharya Thakur, who... Uh, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. So as a Griyasri had a checklist and he checked it off every night. Swami would tell me, he, saw the, he had the list in Orya from Gurudev, and Gurudev checked it off every day. I said this, he'd memorised the whole Gita, but he'd memorised practically the whole Chaitanya 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 Bhagavata, Shuman Bhagavata, like he'd just think of so many things. On a codice he would fast all day and chant the whole Gita. And on other days he would just chant one chapter. But on a codice he'd fast all day and chant the whole Gita. Now, some people get offended when I say this, but bear in mind, this was all done prior to joining ISKCON. He didn't even know what ISKCON was. There was no ISKCON in Arisa until Guru Mahesh went there. there was no, the preaching of A.C. Bhakti and Understanding Prabhupada was not in, Ar in Arisa until Guru Dave went and started it. Number 22, he was thoroughly proficient in all Shastras. Now this is a big one, folks. Number 23, he, never, he had never been to a movie theatre to watch mundane movies. Never done that. Never did that, ever. He did not watch television. Bearing in mind, India is the biggest movie-going uh, country in the world. I was even told they would forego the 10 rupees to buy the rice to go to the movies. Instead of buying the 10 rupees of the rice, I'll give it and go to a movie. And he did not listen to the radio. He didn't involve himself in the mundane sound vibrations that we have we are growing up with and are definitely listening to now. Go home, don't get any sunlight, lock the doors, <laughs> stay home, don't go on the street. <laughs> that's what they're telling you. Oh, I don't watch TV, but that's what they're telling people, right? They're right there. Hide, everyone hide. Don't be out in the sun, because if you go in the sun, there's vitamin D from the sun sign. You don't want to get vitamin D, because vitamin D is very important for the immune system. So you don't want that. 
didn't listen to the radio, and he did not read mundane literature and newspapers until A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada got to Bhuvaneshra and said to him in 1977, he said, if you read the newspaper, you will see, you will get ideas for writing articles for your Aria Back to Godhead. So from that day, you and I used to go and get the newspapers and read them in Aria and take notes from the newspaper for articles. <laughs> because Prabhupada told him. <laughs> Pretty interesting, isn't it, no? I, I even asked him about that. And he, he, I asked him, why are you reading newspaper? Because yeah. I thought it's a bit strange. And he told me, Prabhupada told me to do it. Yeah, that. Prabhupada told him to do it. When, when Prabhupada went to Bhubaneswara, when he would call Guru Maharaj, Guru Maharaj would run, and you know, what's that verse in the Hari Bhagavad Gita? Yatra Yatra Guru Prasya Tatra Tatra Kritanjali. That when you go to the, in front of the Guru, you're supposed to fall like a tree hitting the ground. And Guru Maharaj would do that, he'd just go slap, and his whole body would hit the ground and hear a slapping sound. And devotees are thinking he's going to hurt himself. Because that's what he did. He didn't go, you know, get down on his knees and hand and he'd just go, mm, crash. And everyone witnessed it. <laughs> the real disciple, his uh, Sudabhakta disciple, number one disciple, is the star, is the moon amongst all the stars. Gurudev had never entered a bar or a hotel to drink alcohol, take any type of intoxication. He'd never done that. You know? This is the sort of person we put on a fal palanquin, four of us hold him, and we take him around <laughs> with Kirtan. That's what, you know? He's a living, walking, talking deity. He never took any form of intoxication. Some people complain about this one. He never had a girlfriend. They said, oh, that's a bit offensive to them. But he never had a girlfriend. He didn't do all the sex game we talked about. He didn't do all those things. The whole family didn't do those things. The whole of Gully Giri didn't do those things. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, Gobanath Giri had a girlfriend. I mean, it doesn't make sense. They were strict followers of Vedic culture. They were strict Gordia Vaisnavas. <laughs> They were super Kirtaniers. And Guru Maharaj said his grandfather was a Ma Bhagavad and his, and his two uncles were pure devotees. They were Sutta Bhaktas. He said, that were conditioned souls. And he was celibate till he got married. And when he got married, he engaged his sex life seven times and from that seven children came. And then he gave it up. In his own words, Guru Dev said, right? Having sex and passing stool is the same, time, same thing. So I passed stool seven times, then I left it. He wasn't trying, you know. Never. I remember when I interviewed Krishnananda Prabhu in Bhuvaneshwar in 1991, and he said he saw Guru Maharaj in 1985 and 86 in England. And he said he was just like the picture of austerity. Just the living picture of austerity. So then I make the point, point number 31, he was pure, and I, re I reiterate all this before he met his spiritual master. He was already trained, not trained, <clears throat> ready for, <laughs> ready to lead the mission. Prabhu, I'm going to stop there, Jagdish Panam Prabhu is going to read that. Oh no, it's... Keep on going. Just keep going, okay. Yeah. But I'll get, okay. Now, number 32, he never gambled. Number 33, he never ate meat, of course. <laughs> there was none of that. See, for us, the Westerners in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, you know, joining, you can't eat meat, you can't gamble. You know, that's something we were, you know, aspiring for, striving for. You know what I mean? But he never did. The mind of the sadhu, it's not dwelling on these things. The mind of a bogus sadhu is, is a cheater. Come and riyani samyam ye, ya aste manasasparam, indriya tamimudatma, mityukchara suvichate. The cheating sadhu is a cheater. Right? Because the 
just as a beginner, there's those sort of, they look like something, but just cheating, just always thinking on how to enjoy it. But that's not in the mind of a real sadhu. They're not, they're not thinking, oh, oh. It's like the sannyasi that got caught in Africa with two prostitutes and a <laughs> bottle of whiskey. Well, it's like, you know, Guru not going to do that. I remember when we flew from um, Kulingada to Sydney on the first tour, uh, Guru Dave was by the window, Chaitanya Chandra was in the middle, and I was on the aisle, right? And we got these... Um, the boarding passes, and on the back of the boarding pass it said, put this boarding pass in the special bins provided and you can win a Rolls Royce. So I said to Gurudev, Gurudev, because um, I thought, well, we're in the Rolls Royce. You can build another temple, Gurudev, or whatever. You know? like, so I said, Gurudev, uh, I explained it to him, and then we put him in the bins, right? And we got three passes, he said, gambling. I said, but we don't have to, we haven't had to pay for the ticket to enter. He said, it's still gambling. So I just threw him in the bin. I didn't put him in the bin for the winter prize, I just put him in the bin. Actually, I kept them. <laughs> Souvenirs. But so you know, that's how strict he was. It's not that he was <laughs> And then and then when we were driving from Sydney Temple to North Sydney Temple, <clears throat> Guru said to me, I, um, what's a Rolls Royce? <laughs> I didn't even know a Rolls Royce, which is fair enough. Uh, anyway, you know, he, he wasn't into this fancy watches, you know, the, the, the Rolex watches and the $2,000 gold, uh, gold encrusted glasses and the, all that stuff, you know. He wasn't in there, he was a sadhu. The chair from Sri Ranga, he, he didn't, <laughs> didn't have a Rolex or, you know, any of that fancy glasses. He was a sadhu. It is danda, it is cloth, bars. In fact, we'll get to it, but they told me in Bhubaneshwara, in the late 70s, early 80s, especially the late 70s, there was just one hut, the kitchen was sort of a kitchen, and I think maybe another hut. And when you went to sleep at night, you had a straw mat, and that's what you laid on. There was no mosquito net, there was no sheets, blankets, pillows, nothing. And if you were cold, you had your wrap, what you've got on, and you pulled that over yourself. That's it. There was no, there was no, nothing. There was nothing. But I'll get to all that. But, you know, and that's how Gurudev lived. And the other Brahmin shows, they couldn't say to Gurudev, we want this and that, because Gurudev didn't have it. He didn't have it. He slept on the floor, and he pulled his wrap over himself, and there was no mosquito nets. And sometimes Gurudev went the whole day without eating. He just didn't eat. Someone forgot to cook, Guru Mahesh would just keep translating. He didn't even look up. It's as if, okay, they didn't cook. I mean, if we don't eat, we'll freak out. He just didn't care. He wasn't worried, he wasn't perturbed. It was very austere. Very austere. So, <laughs> I remember when Raghava Pandit laid this book out for me, right? And then when he finished it, he read it, he said, Nimai, Everybody should should get these hundred and eight points tattooed to their bodies. <laughs> Whoops. I'll get it. You know, everybody should get everyone should have these hundred and eight points of Buddha tattooed to their bodies. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now number thirty-four. Have we run out of power? No, no, it's just this one says Low, low power mode. Yeah. Now, Gurudev had a very good friend called Charan Kanungo, who was a science professor, and I think he was the regional manager for one third of the schools in Orissa. He was a very smart fellow. And he and Gurudev went to um, Haridwar Rishikesh. 1971. Are we off the air, are we? No, no, it's going, but I might go and get a, some power onto it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and some pretty interesting things happened, and this is one of the things. 
some of the, so he wrote a book about all this and he called it the world famous Gorgamindu Swami and the village Galagiri. Right? And this is what happened in 1971. <clears throat> he said himself and Guru Maharaj went in February of 1971 to the Himalayas. Right? We had a meeting with a sadhu who foretold the future of Srila Gurgavinda Swami. So out of the blue, this sadhu came up to them and saw Guru Maharaj and said, you. <laughs> and started telling them all these things. So there's another example. And this Charan Kanika, he saw this. He saw this a few times. He was pretty shocked. The sadhu said in 1974, now this is 1971, you must leave your home and your most cherished desire will be fulfilled. Well, what was Gurudev's cherished desire? Leave family life, take sannyas. And that happened on April 1st, 1974, Ram Navami. Bang. Then he said, you will utilize all your power and ability for the use of the Supreme Lord's service, which you did. Then he said, devotees will feel very much fortunate by reading your life story. Read these books because you're going to learn something. No offence, I know I compiled them, but if you think Gorgavinda Swami is a conditioner of Majid, if you think he's a conditioned soul, if you think he's not the Acharya after Prabhupada, you better read these books and you'll become enlightened. No offence. No offence. And if you want to discuss it with me, I'm happy to discuss it. Then he said, Devotees will feel very much fortunate by reading your life story and they will come under your feet for help and advice. At the time of distress and danger, your love and purification will be the only solace for hundreds and hundreds of souls and you will be famous among great saintly persons. This is out of the blue, this fellow came. Sadhu, he was a sadhu. You will be the best among the devotees. You will be an acharya, a great rishi. See, there's that word acharya again. And your, and your will, sorry, and you will show the path of perfection to many. In the end, you'll return to Galoka Vrindavan, your eternal home. I mean, Your Honour, I rest my case, you know. We're not dealing with the Kanishta or Modem, even someone on bar. We're dealing with a resident of that Galoka Vrindavan region who has come here to deliver. And you all, if you're listening and you're out there, have offended him to such a degree he left early. Baba. No offence, if you did, that's great, but those ones that did, they, they, they should understand this. So 35, he gave up family life, wife and seven children. 1 April 1974, Ram Navami, then wandered India, right? South, east, west, and north, right? Seeking a bona fide spiritual master who would give him sannyas and entrance into the preaching mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And when he was in, the Himalayas, he was in Haridwar and Rishikesh and he lived in so many ashrams and he got kicked out of so many ashrams because he was preaching Harinam and the personalist point of view and they were all impersonalists and they kept kicking him out. <laughs> and Guru said, finally I found a Babaji in the forest who had built a little hut. You can imagine what that hut was like, right? And he said, the Babaji chanted Hare Krishna, I chanted Hare Krishna, so the Babaji let me stay lived in that hut, but then he realised, oh, I'm not getting anywhere. Then he decided, I'll go to Vrindavan. And he said he went to Ayodhya, but he said everyone there speaks Ramayana, but no one speaks Bhagavatam. And he said some places they speak the Bhagavatam, but he said no one spoke the Chaitanya Chaitanya went all over and no one spoke it. No one discussed Chaitanya Chaitanya And those were the three things he was looking for. Krishna, Mahaprabhu, and the Srimad Bhagavatam. And he, he just didn't hear it. And he stayed in so many aspects. And he said he was in Vrindavan for two weeks. I said, I better run. Yeah, he was in Vrindavan for two weeks. <clears throat> just wandering around. And he 
we'd have to slip under trees and he slept on the side of the highway. He said he slept with the beggars at the train station, just whatever. There's a river. He just go take bath, you know, and carry on. And uh, when he needed to go by train, he'd go to the conductor, I have no money. Can you give me a ticket? The conductor said, just get on. <laughs> so there was no, there was no, um, <clears throat> we're good? There was no, there was no, um, <laughs> there was no money for Guru Dave, right? No opulence, nothing. Uh, there was nothing. He had nothing. He, when he left family home, he had a top cloth, a bottom cloth, stick, a pot, and his Bhagavad Gita, and he wrote notes in that. And that's how he lived. <laughs> and for nearly six months, he lived like that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> oh, personally, all those people that offended you today, they have to atone for that. And they know who they are and they really have to atone for it. And, and as disciples, if we're trying to block glue those glories and cover them over and push them aside and promote ourselves, it's bad news. It's very bad news. Okay, Jagadish Pandit's going to speak now, and I'm going to speak again tomorrow night. Don't know what's for you. Hey. You got a question? Yeah, how long did he spend in Vrindavan before he met Srila Prabhupada? About two weeks. Just wandering around, he said, aimlessly looking, <laughs> just looking. Don't know what's for you. You've got to do with Shah Groups and Dubia, which I particularly don't know what's for you. No more on Vishnu, but I agree with some of the statements that I've said in this one.